Ah, good evening, friends. How is everybody? Oh, we got a not, not only a low crowd, but a shallow crowd. <laughs> All right. So I'll start us off as usual with a prayer list. Uh, let's remember Sam and Amy Watson. Um, that was Brenda Watson's grandson that had a baby last week. Uh, the baby was nine pounds and four ounces. And I've been saying, if you want to go pick him up, you better get over there in a hurry. But so he gets stupid. <laughs> um, but that that's a good thing. And uh, I hope the best for Sam and Amy. Yeah. And and if you know Sam, Sam is he's much. And they're kind of like an odd couple because he's so big and it's it's like Nolan and Dana. It's he's he's really big and she's really small, and it's just kind of funny. Does anybody else have any other joys or concerns? He came from John came home. We'll still pray for him. Maybe we ought to pray for Mitzi a little bit more. Yeah. Are there any others? Nice, quiet crowd tonight. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of another day, and thank you that we live in a country where we're free to gather in your house even in the middle of the week, to come and study your word. Open our minds tonight as, as we turn to your word. Inspire each one in this room, all of the readers, the same way that you inspired the original writers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah, okay, so we started on the 20th of June which was, page, the questions are on page 590, right? There was a lot of reading. There was a lot of reading this week, wasn't there? It was a little extra. So how does Isaiah's pride lead him to act? And why is his sin so serious? He went in the sanctuary and he was burning the incense, even with the priest standing there yelling at him. And do you remember what happened to Aaron's sons that went in and built the wrong kind of fire? And I, I was like, oh my gosh. He, he's going to die. But God didn't put the hammer down on him, but then, then you kind of read the... Well, we're I, yeah, the I, I think I might really just go ahead and die and have leprosy. <laughs> um, so what, what can we learn about pride by watching Uzziah, King Uzziah? And do you remember when John was here last year? I think you had left for your... The, the first Sunday of the revival. The verse is actually pride goes before destruction. And I, all the rest were like, oh, pride goes before a fall. And John was like, no, no. Pride goes before destruction. And and I was like, ooh. But what, what did we learn about pride from watching King of Zion? Yes, pride goes before a fall or destruction. I, I like it either way. But what else can we learn about pride? It causes you to forget your place. I mean, it was his voice didn't matter that he was the king. You begin to get out of your lane. Yeah. You start minding other people's business. Or you think the world's gonna pleasure you. Because you think your business is all taken care of. Right. And then to, to my favorite prophet, when Jonah hears God's message, how does he respond and what does it cost him? He run one different direction. And what did it cost him? 
<laughs> so he ran the opposite way and it caused him being thrown into the sea and being swallowed by a fish. So how does God eventually get Jonah to Nineveh? The fish spewed him out on land. But what happened just before that? He burst. And he repented for running from God. And and he kind of gave back into God and he said, Okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Right? Basically. Now he didn't use those exact words. But that's and and I think we run right past that. But we need to understand that Jonah from the belly of the fish prayed to God and 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 said, Hey, look, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Ma'am, no, he really didn't. He didn't know what to do in there. So, um, part of the prayer is I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. The seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O oh Lord, you snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. So he's telling God, look, I, you've saved me before, and I know you'll save me again. And, and I'll try again this time. So don't run right past the prayer, and don't forget that, that Jonah did repent from the belly of the fish. So how do the people of Nineveh respond and how does Jonah react to God's work? The people repented and the king called for a, a fast that even the animals weren't supposed to eat. The animals have to be in front of that too. Couldn't eat. And say what you said a minute ago. Jonah gets mad. Jonah got mad. Why is Jonah mad? I think he's going to have his way. He said, I told him to. He didn't lie. Well, he didn't like them. They were warring people. They were, and I've I've said this before. You know, we we invaded Iraq. Uh, the the number one city that we had the most trouble with in Iraq was Mosul. The highway goes north and south, and from Mosul right across the highway are the ruins of Nineveh. There has always been conflict in that part of the world. And, and it goes all the way back to, to Jonah. It, it was nothing new for those people to be at war. So why does Jonah get so mad about that? Yeah, he didn't like them. He gets mad because God was merciful and he keeps on forgiving the people. They're merciful and compassionate. He's going to forgive them again. And what did, what did Jonah want God to do? See, John went into town and he's like, hey, in 30 days, none of them. <laughs> and then he went up on a hill and put up a little shelter and waited. <laughs> and when it didn't happen, Jonah basically looks at God and says, I knew you wouldn't do it. I knew that would and I knew you wouldn't do it. That's right. Like that. But then God says, what are you mad about? 
Remember the little plant, the vine with the leaf that was blocking the sun off of, off of Jonah? And then a worm came and ate it, and it withered. And that made Jonah. What's Jonah mad about? And God even says, you didn't make that vine grow. You didn't make the worm go in there. What are you mad about? You didn't make those people. And he goes, yes, you feel sorry about a plant that dies because that had been for you, but you feel okay with me just wiping out 120,000 people. Exactly. So, and I, I kind of chalk Jonah up to pride also. We, we were just talking about pride a minute ago. Jonah is letting his pride lead him around by the nose because he went into town and said, hey, God's going to destroy y'all in 40 days. Well, they repented. But they repented, and, and God didn't do it. So Jonah's pride got the better of him for a little while. All right, so on 21 June, on page 595, Amos challenges Israel about the importance of walking together. How does, it's in Amos 3, chapter 3, verse 3, how does this verse speak to our relationship with God and our relationships with others? Amos 33, and two people walk together from the brink of the direction. Mm -hmm. I'm Jackson. It also has on um, the verse 7. Along with that, indeed, the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophets. So it's like you have to have a plan before you move forward. And, and two, two people have to agree with each other before they begin to move, before they go walking in one direction. So don't throw stuff at me. When we walk together, we need to agree on which way we're going to go. Similar to our former denomination, we all have to agree on the rules that we will all follow. We call it a covenant. And when you make a covenant with someone, you should keep it. I've explained a covenant here, right? In the Old Testament, their lives were on the line. So, to, to me, I, I take this, this word covenant very seriously. Uh, how does Amos expose the hypocrisy of Israel's worship? And in what ways do his words speak to our religious practices today? Okay. What about chapter three, verses nine through fifteen? Take your seats in the is that right? Yes, three, 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 nine through fifteen. Amos speaking for God talks about destroying the summer homes and winter mansions of the people. In verse 10, he says, My people have forgotten how to do right. Are we doing right by coming and sitting in church every Sunday morning? Start. Is that all we do? 
Will it take a month of opinion? Or we just check the box if we did it? Are we reaching out to people here in this world who are hurting? Are we offering a healing place for people to come and worship? Have we as God's people forgotten how to do right? <laughs> yeah, we've come a long way as a nation. But have we as God's people, the ones who come and sit in church on every every Sunday morning, have we forgotten how to do right? Have we forgotten and we, we say a prayer every, the first Sunday of every month. We have not heard the cry of the needy. We have not been a faithful church. We have not done your will. Are we as God's people earnestly seeking his will and seeking to do what, what he would call us to do? Why does Amos condemn the prosperity of Israel and what does he promise to those who misuse their prosperity? This question is actually answered in the question before in chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. God's going to destroy people's summer homes and winter mansions, and God's going to do away with their prosperity. But what has happened to the people? They have turned from the God who made them prosperous. And this could go back to the pride conversation because they forget about God. When the, when the times start going good, when things start really smooth sailing, the first thing we do is we forget. We stop reading our Bible. We stop saying our prayers. And we just go enjoy the good life. But then when something disastrous happens, we turn around and say, God, why did you do this? Don't. And we're not any different than the people in the Bible. They did it. We do it. We do it exactly like they did. The last question on that page is what warning applies even to today? And I just said it. If, if we turn from God, which if we look around, the world has turned from God. The majority of the people around us have turned from God. But we too will come to an end of our prosperity if we turn from God. Then on the 22nd of June, the questions are on page 600. How does Amos, how does, and this is possessive, how does Amos's plumb line measure walls 
and what plumb line is God using today to measure his people? It will no longer ignore our sins. You will use the phone line to test us. It will no longer ignore our sins. So how does he measure a wall with a plumb line? We and most of us probably don't even know what a plumb line is, do we? It's a it's a string with a weight on it. No, y'all are talking about a chalk line. Yes. A plumb line is something you hang from the ceiling, and that's going to be a vertical line because gravity is not going to pull it through. That's right, and that's. And, and they call that a plumb line, and in every house, there's one. And and that's like a one plumb two-by-four that all the carpenters reference off of. And as long as everything else they built is square, the whole house is square, isn't it? And, and that little weight with a, with a sharp point on the end. So how does Amos use that plumb line to measure the walls? If a wall is leaning, that's how that's what's going to give it away. Is is measuring it with that. So what's this got to do with people? If, if they're leaning towards Baal, or if they're leaning into the world, if they're giving in to sin, then this plumb line is going to bring them out. Now what plumb line does God use on us? It's a sign of the following is yes. the cross might make a pretty good plumb line in our lives. That cross in the middle of the sanctuary, that is where we center our worship, right? The the sanctuary is centered on that cross. I know the building was here before the cross was, but it was intended for the building to be centered around that spot. Notice I didn't say the pulpit or the preacher, but the cross. And if, if we're not all kneeling at the foot of the cross, then we're, we're not leaning in to the right plumb, even all the way back to Amos's time. Why does Amaziah seek to chase Amos away, and how does Amos respond? He is stepping on his toes. So, If, if you boil down what a prophet did in the Old Testament, prophets only did three things. They spoke out against the sin of the day, and they spoke into, if you will repent, God will not do anything. If you don't repent, here's what the punishment will be. So they had, they had basically three jobs. Preach, preach against the current sin, Preach to people about repentance and give God's warning if the people don't repent. So when Amos shows up, and he starts preaching against the current sin, like if y'all were a bunch of alcoholics and I come in here and I'm preaching against alcohol, never going to happen, but... Let's say I was in here 20 years ago and y'all came me in preaching about against alcohol. That would be more likely. That would make me a little uncomfortable, right? Because now you're hitting my sin like a hammer on a nail. You, you're hitting it. And that's all Amos did. Amos walked in and started pointing out the current sin of the current time that all the people were guilty of. It made the priest uncomfortable because 
he didn't feel like he could stand against the current sin. Just like if I was cheating on Madra, I would stop breathing all of a sudden. But let's say if I were to cheat on Madra, could I come in here and preach to you against adultery? How hypocritical would I be? So here's Amaziah, the priest, probably guilty of the same sin that everybody else in the town is guilty of, so no wonder he won't preach against it. Uh, so how does Amos respond to him when he tries to run him off? It sounds a lot of pressure on him. I don't think they were I wasn't born into being a prophet like you were born into being a priest. I've just been called by God. So what does that say about Amos and, and his trust in God? He went back to everything. Right. But the answer I'm looking for is not in the Bible. What does that say about Amos and the trust that he puts in God? Sean really said that somebody said what he's saying to him and then said, Well, I'm not, I don't care what you're saying. That's what the Lord told him. Mm -hmm. And Amos knows God's not going to let you do anything to me. God's not going to let you do anything to me. So Amos had faith that God would take care of him through all of these situations that, that God was putting him in. What does his answer teach us about God's prophets? You're in the right verses. Chapter 7, verses 14 through 17. God can call whoever God wants to call. Just like the same conversation that God had with Jonah. This isn't yours. You didn't make any of this. I made this, and I'll do with it what I want to. Right, that's and and if that those hundred twenty thousand people repent, I won't punish them because they're they're gods. Uh, so basically, Amos is saying that that God's not speaking through you because you're not listening. God called me, and I'm actually listening, even though I'm just a farmer, a dumb redneck out in the in the woods, right. Why does the vision of the Lord's holiness and the throne shape Isaiah so deeply? By the way, this is probably my favorite story in the Bible, the calling of Isaiah. The, the one Hebrew word that I can always remember is Hanane. Hanane. And, and it's this common for us English speakers. But in the Hebrew, when, when you hear like, when Abraham's on the mountain and he's got Isaac tied down and he's got a knife up, and the angel of the Lord says, stop Abraham, don't hurt the child. Abraham looks up and in English we read, here I am. In Hebrew, it was Hanane. And in the Hebrew Hanane, it means much more than here I am. Okay? If Trish and I were having a conversation, and if Trish looked over at me and said, Hey, Brother Brad, and I looked back at Trish and said, Hanane, it would be as if y'all don't even exist anymore. And now it's just me and Trish are the only two people on the planet. And I'm giving her my undivided attention, even though there's cars going by the door out there. I know all y'all are still in the room. But the Hinene is a devotion from the sayer to the one that's asking. Does that make sense? And, and so here's Isaiah in, in this temple a smoke-filled temple. Now think about it. He was a sinful man. Sinful people cannot look at God. The smoke was the spirit 
acting as a buffer between Isaiah and the real vision of God. Because if he would have seen the real God, it would have killed him and he would have died. That's what shook him up so badly about being in that temple and having that vision. He even says, it's all over, I'm doomed, for I'm a sinful man, I have filthy lips, and I live among people with filthy lips, yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. That's Isaiah 6, verse 5. He thought he was going to be doomed. And, and by the way, if you keep reading, the angel goes and gets a, an ember from the fire and touches his lips. That's the purification process. So how many of us had to go through a disaster before we gave in to God? Am I the only one in the room? And, and so the purification process, and then God calls. God's word is spoken. Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, Hanane, God, it's you and me. You have my full undivided attention. See what I'm saying? See where the, the Hebrew really brings a lot of it to life. Uh, but I, I don't like saying a lot of Hebrew words. But that one, I can actually remember that Hanane because it just sounds so funny. What does his response teach us about being in God's presence? It's, all. It's, it's awesome. But think about a Sunday morning worship service. We come in and God's glory hopefully fills the sanctuary. We sing songs just like they sang songs. We have God's word proclaimed. We have sort of a purification and invitation to purification at the, at the chancel rail. And then your response to God every Sunday should be, Hanemo, here I am, God. You have my full undivided attention. And so every Sunday we get recentered on God. So when God does call, we can answer and say, Hanane, you have my full attention. Is that good? See, that's, and we, we follow the Bible even during a worship service. Uh, then question 23, Gene, questions on page 603. First question, what is the contradiction between Jotham's personal walk with the Lord and the spiritual condition of the people? He walked it, but didn't get rid of the shrines and things that were there. He, he was in the world. He was walking with God. In, in fact, the in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 27, verse 6, on page 600, it says, Jotham, quote, was careful to live in obedience to the Lord his God. But you're right. The people continued to offer sacrifices at the pagan shrines. Because he did not destroy them. Because he didn't tear them down. So what sins does King Ahaz embrace, and how does the Lord bring judgment on him for his sin? Instead of following the example of the kings of Israel, he even sacrificed his own son in the fire. That's 16, chapter 16. Second Kings 16, verses 3 and 4, on page 601. Uh, and instead, he followed the sacrifice. In this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burnt incense at the pagan shrines 
and on the hills under every green tree. Uh, Second Chronicles 28. Uh, we read even more that he did wrong. That's on page 602. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord as his ancestor David had done. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel. He cast metal images for the worship of Baal. He offered sacrifices in the, in the valley, uh, even sacrificing his own sons in the fire. In this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations. It, it depends. Uh, but they could have been just babies, or they could have been like up to maybe the age of 10. They would have taken them. He has one son, like his son. But he like his his son's plural, yeah. Well, son's killed. Or maybe have y'all ever seen the statue that they used to have at Baal? There's a big bronze statue and his arms like were out like this. And and it was hollow. And from behind the priests would load firewood in and they would build a big fire. And where this this statue had its arms. You would lay your baby in the arms, and it would cook the baby. Oh my! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no wonder God finds it so detestable, right? Where else has God judged a nation for the ruler's sin? It's Pharaoh. The Tower of Babel. The leadership there was pretty tore up. Anywhere else? Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, how does Ahaz exhaust the patience? How does Ahaz exhaust the patience of God? And why do his actions bring announcements of judgment? Ah, page 603. The Lord told Master the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, I asked. Make this difficult as you want. A sign I said in her as deep as the place of the dead, but the king refused. No one said, I won't test the Lord like that. And I said, he said, listen, well, boy, the family of David is said, not the big thought. Your patience must be exhausted. The patience of my God. Well, mm. all right, Lord Himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will see the child, and she'll give birth to a son. Yes. So, even God telling him directly, "Let me help you understand who I am," and He won't even do that. Right. Right. <laughs> Anything else on that? Uh, the 24th of June, the questions were on page 608. Why does God command people not to seek counsel from the dead? And what guidance does he offer, offer for his people? Why are we people seeking counsel? Well, don't forget about three weeks ago, that lady called Elisha back. And the first thing out of Elisha's mouth was, why are you bothering me? Well, I guess in that case, it's like a person. You know what I mean? He helped him with But they still shouldn't have done it. You, you're right. So, um, but they, I know he wants them to look to God for instructions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they don't. God says, uh, it's chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. 
on page six out of four. Uh, some may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. With their whisperings and mutterings, they will tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Super living, seek guidance from the dead. Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his words are completely in the dark. They will go from one place to another, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry... They will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down at earth, but whatever they look, there will be wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. Uh, and then they will be thrown out into the darkness. So how can the the question was, and somebody already said this, how can the living counsel how can the dead counsel the living on what to do? It's to me, it's just stupid. So it's not a blasphemous that can raise people from the dead. So why is it making this really And and why 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 would they try? In fact, in the commandments, the commands in the law, um, God said, "Don't don't do it anyway." Well, then they're calling on sorcery. Right. Instead of calling on God, right? How do people today seek counsel from the wrong sources? I had to Google how to spell Ouija board, by the way. See, I didn't, I didn't even go as far as the news. I just said stuff like Ouija boards, tarot, 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 tarot. What about horoscopes? Yeah. I did that one too. Uh, the zodiac signs. I don't know if that was supposed to be against, you know, God, but, but it's like, I guess, made then something else besides God. But it's, you know, I used to read my words because I was getting candy, you know. So did I. I used to read mine. Even though I read, I can't read, but she was trying to see it. I just saw it. Yeah. I did like, um, what is it? I say, April, eleven, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's our denomination. <laughs> How does I went to a full hotel and when I was 20 years old, I was working in the hospital in Florida, a long time ago, and I lost my keys to my office. And I was in front of Coach Pro. I don't remember who even took me, but I'll tell you one thing: when I never went back again, I never went back again. And I was like, "This is weird." Same thing. I did find kids. You never did find what? Well, it's not like that. It's not like that. How does Isaiah describe the light for the people who walk in darkness? Two and three, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land in deep darkness, a light will shine. And then God did give us a great light, right? Uh, what are his titles? And how will his reign give people hope? Oh. Wonderful counsel, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, mm -hmm. 
How will his reign give people hope? Peace, fairness, justice. Peace and justice to all who come in contact with him or get to know him. Even through us. See, that's something God didn't think about, right? We're supposed to be the ones inter introducing the people out here to Jesus. They say... Uh, they don't know if he actually said it, but there's a quote uh, from St. Francis. Uh, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And people are always watching. That's why I have both hands on the steering wheel now. Regard, good or bad, you sit there with Right. And this this is actually St. Francis. Um, go and preach the Bible. And if you have to, use words. How does Isaiah describe the time when the branch will rule? Of the line, the line of the the line of 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 he will not judge by appearances nor make decisions based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear the right he will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. June twenty fifth, the pages are on uh, questions are on page six twelve. What has the Lord done for Isaiah that makes him sing? Well, look on page six of eight, Isaiah chapter twelve, verses one through six. God gives Isaiah a glimpse into the future salvation of the nation. And that's, so in that day I will sing, I will praise you, O Lord. You are angry with me, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. See, God has come to save me. He's seeing the vision of Jesus in the future and God coming to save not just Isaiah, but all of us. What does Isaiah chapter 12 teach about salvation that gives us hope today? It teaches that this was, I'm sorry, go ahead. Say it. Say it. It teaches us that it was God's plan all along. God knew what God was doing. All God was doing was waiting on God's perfect time to begin. How does Ahaz's example teach about asking for help from people instead of turning to the Lord. Now, depending on which one you read this in, Kings, Second Kings, or Second Chronicles, because it's in both of them. 
But Ahaz asked the king of Assyria for help. Uh, and when the king of Assyria arrived, his army attacked Ahaz's army instead of helping him. That's in I got I got this one from Second Chronicles 28, verse 16, and then verse 20 on page 609. And this should teach us to always ask God what to do instead of just jumping in with someone else. Ask God for help instead of asking someone else for help. To what or to whom do we often turn to for help in our problems instead of the Lord? Ourselves. We look to ourselves. I, I wanted to leave this one blank for discussion, but I actually put in a few answers. Beer, drugs, sex, porn, TV, or the internet. Professional paid counselors. We look everywhere but church. By the way, I'm, I'm not a professional counselor. Good luck. <laughs> All I can give you is the Bible. So. That is so true. Um, so I used to take vitamins just any time, you know, and, and I was taking them in the hospital. I saw these. No, you shouldn't take vitamins just any time. You should take the same time every day. You're supposed to take them with It's like, I'm not just, no, I have been helped. And then I was talking to a pharmacy. Did you let a stranger? No idea who walked up and do anything stopped you from doing something good because they, you know, so people do it. They, you know, it happens. We will listen to outside sources because we think they know more than us. We don't, we don't know. So we figure if somebody's telling us, they must know. But they don't understand. You think? <laughs> so why does Hezekiah destroy the bronze serpent that Moses made in the wilderness? People will worship. They were beginning to offer sacrifices to it. So then. How can things that started out as good become idols? And what should we do about them? I told you I used to ride a Harley and I used to get down with wax and I would literally be on my knees polishing that. Was that my way of getting down and Giving my sacrifice to the God of Harley Davidson. <laughs> I took that, I took that motorcycle between me and God, and when God decided to take it out of the way, it was kind of violent. you could right. and not worship them. Right, you could go too far. And and I went too far. I did go too far. I just explained. <laughs> so what else what, what else do we live become idols in our lives oh. like these big churches for example we have one in this area that's had some backlash recently started out good as church for God but then it's going to start starting to be them but nobody did it there you go. Don't throw things up. But the church can't become more about social mm -hmm. outlet and clicks and who's who, who's who, who goes there. Then you're not going even to your church for the right reason. Then you're in a whole world of hurt. It, yeah, it doesn't even have to be a big church. And, and that's. If you notice around here, 
I try not to even receive a financial report, but she forces it on me. I, I stay very far away from y'all's money. That, I mean, it is. You're choked money. I, I stay, well, I stay away from y'all's money, too. But I, I stay away from church money as well. You, there will never come a time that you think I'm digging in, in the pot. There will never come a time. I promise you. I'm saying it's very easy. Just like I've had friends that go to church and play that, and it can very easily become social gathering or... She wore this when she went last night. He wore that. Mm. Separated from what When I went through licensing school, we had a, a Dave Hilliard was his name. Do y'all know that name? Dave Hilliard. He used to be in this area. Um, and, and he spoke to our, our licensing school and he said, when you men go to the pulpit, you need to have on a suit and tie. And when you women go to the pulpit, you need to have on a robe. And we had a lady in the class raise her hand. She's like, hey, 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 why should we wear a robe? And he looked at her and said, just like with the men, if they're not going to be in a suit and tie, the women will look at you, and in their minds, they will think, I can't believe she's wearing those shoes and that shirt. <laughs> and then you as the preacher have lost that woman, and she'll never hear a word you say. And, <laughs> and, and so even, even like in a, in a good church, and I, I call this a good church, if, if I come up, if I wear a clown suit, you're going to think, God, what's that clown doing behind me? Right? If I get up there and act like an idiot, or if I get up there and don't read the Bible, we turned it from church into a social event. And and that's that's when y'all need to get together and fire me. <laughs> but it's and leave me alone. Uh, okay, yeah. So and then today's today's reading, gosh. We're almost there, yeah. Questions on page six, sixteen. How does God read Israel back to himself? And in what ways does Hosea demonstrate this action? Gosh, I wrote a bunch. Uh, page 613. God offers forgiveness and comfort to Israel instead of punishment and judgment. God loves Israel, and that is a fact. But Israel has turned from God so many times. Hosea brings God's words to life by going and paying the price for his wife by not having sex with her for several days. Um, and then in verses 4 and 5, Hosea gives us a little commentary on that. Quote, this shows that Israel... Will go a long time, will go a long time without a king or a prince and without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterwards, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendant, their king. In, in the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. Look at that last word in that statement right there, goodness. Isaiah doesn't mention anything about judgment or God's harshness except to say that God is not going to greet Israel with harshness and judgment. He's going to meet Israel with goodness. What does this teach us about God? Man, <laughs> And, and God is always trying to woo us back to himself. Yes. Ma'am? He has favorites. Israel is his favorite. I cannot argue with that. I, and it's, it's funny when you hear some preachers preach on TV, they talk about Israel is no longer the chosen nation. And I'm like, 
Oh, are you throughout that? Uh, how can Israel return to the Lord? And what does he promise to those who will return? In chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, the whole comment is devoted to God's words about Israel coming back to him. Uh, I only put in here verses 1 through 3. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us. Now he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as sure as the arrival of, of the dawn or the coming rains in early spring. The beginning of these verses talk about uh, what the people should do. The second part of each verse tells what God will do. The first verse says, let us return to the Lord. Then it says, he has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. That is the way Hosea explained uh, that the nation of Israel should repent and turn back to God. What does it mean by, what does Hosea mean by, they have planted the wind and will harvest a whirlwind in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7. On page 616. All their are going to destruction. Oh, yes. We've got to give it a little context, though, right? So I went back to verse 5, and Hosea is prophesying against Samaria saying that they are worshiping a calf that their hands have made. They must smash the calf to bits. And then he says, they have planted, they have planted the wind and will harvest the whirlwind. The people are asking for trouble by worshiping the calf that they made with their hands instead of worshiping the one true God that created them with his hands, the same God that brought them out of Egypt and into the land flowing with milk and honey. Say it again now. Say it again now. The Lord says, I want you to show love. I want you to know me more than I want for the When I read that, it's called. That part is about me because all of them, like they, when they're reading it and we can say thing when they're reading it and they come up and they say, Well, this will make it better. This will be better. I screwed it. I screwed up, but this will be better. This will make it better. He's like, I don't want it. And we tried to do that too. Well, I made a mistake. I'm going to pray today and not make it He just wants me to know but doesn't want you to try to do it. You don't want to do that. And God, God is always offering forgiveness and opportunity to repent. Uh, we call him the, the God of second chances for the millionth time. So they can just go their emotions. They can just go and do the motions. And and that's that's what happened with the sacrifices and the burnt offerings. They they were coming to the priest and they were saying, which I related to puppy dogs and kitty cats because that's our current animals that we take care of. Well, they're just bringing a, a lamb or a sheep and they're having it slaughtered. Somebody else raised it. Somebody else cared for it from the time it was this big until they got it to take it to the priest. Well, now it doesn't mean that much to you. And, and so that, that was never God's plan for all that. But now God is saying, look, show kindness, love, and forgiveness. I want that more than, than your sacrifices because the sacrifices have become empty. Right, right. Anything else? Anybody with anything else? Anybody online?
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift. Thank you that we can come and study your word, please, as we're trying to plant seeds. We ask that you come along and water the seeds and, and create growth in our lives. Send your Holy Spirit to drill down into us what we have been studying this week and what we will study the coming week. Inspire each of us the same way you did the original writers. As we go from this place, keep us from all that is evil until we can gather again and worship your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.